Hiring new colleagues is one of the most important things we do as an academic community. The colleagues we hire commit to a career in our faculty and have great influence in our students and young researchers and their notions of what excellence in science looks like. They impact our research programs and are a direct reflection of what we value as a community. So when we're hiring, how do we know who is the best person for a job? In particular, why aren't we more successful at hiring women professors? Even though many women earn degrees and PhDs in science and go on to do a postdoc, so far, we don't seem able to tap into this pool of talent as much as we should be when it comes to hiring professors. Along the way from undergraduate to graduate student, from postdoc to the first professorship, women are, indeed, leaving the pipeline in great numbers. But why? There are likely many different reasons why women decide to leave academia. Not all of them are problematic. After all, many people just decide that they want to do something else with their lives. And that's just fine. But we have to remind ourselves that every person who leaves makes their decision in a context. And some of the ways academia works disadvantage women compared to men. There is a large and ever-growing body of empirical research on this subject. Cutting a long story short, this means that regardless of their talent as a scientist, some groups of people can build an academic career with tailwinds pushing them on, while other groups of people have to try and do the same thing while facing headwinds. And it's important to recognize that it's our job as a hiring committee to see the scientific potential of individuals and not their social identities. Now, don't get us wrong here. Deliberate discrimination is rare. The much bigger problem these days are assumptions we routinely make about men and women. For instance, we might say that we're looking for a world leader in their field. But do we really evaluate men's and women's potential and achievements equally? If we don't, we'll miss out on the women scientists who fit our criteria. And here's the thing, data tells us over and over that we don't evaluate men and women equally. Oh, and by the way, the research shows one more interesting thing. All of us have the same tendencies here. There is no difference between women and men. Everyone has biases, which is what creates the headwinds and tailwinds we talked about a moment ago. So what do we do? Do we lean back and accept that we all have our flaws? No. Do we hyper-concentrate in the hour-long meetings so that we don't fall into simplified and automatic ways of thinking? No, that's mission impossible. Instead, we design tools that help us get a handle on the aspects of academic work which we know create advantages and disadvantages for people that aren't related to their achievements and potential. More on that soon. But first, let's look at our hiring data. So, keeping all this in mind, how is the UZH Faculty of Science doing with respect to gender equality? In the decade ending 2020, the percentage of women professors has grown to its highest percentage yet, 22%. While this is a positive change, it is still far from the parity we aim for. Now, focusing in a bit more, we look at our competitive professorial hiring process. Here we can see that the hiring of men has historically outpaced the hiring of women until 2018, 2019, and 2020. What happened in these years? Of course, we cannot say for certain, but what we do know is that in 2015, new recruitment procedures were put in place. These measures are still a part of recruitment today. As a member of a hiring committee, you need to know what the measures are, and perhaps more importantly, the intent behind them, and what we know about their effects. To increase the number of women entering the hiring process, the committee must hand in a gender-balanced list, 50-50, of academics that the committee considers to be suitable candidates for the position. The hiring committee contacts all listed individuals, who then might apply or not. With this procedure in place, we saw the number of women applying for positions change in the last decade. In the applications, we improve fairness by looking at candidates' achievement relative to opportunity. This means we look at a candidate's academic age. How many years of full-time equivalents of academic employment have passed since they completed their PhD? 
We also think critically about the criteria we use to judge candidates' scientific excellence by signing the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. We strive to eliminate the use of journal-based metrics such as journal impact factors in funding, appointment, and promotion considerations, and assess research on its own merits rather than on the basis of the journal in which the research is published. And to improve the chance of fair, unbiased evaluation once a woman makes it to the interview stage, the measures challenge us to avoid so-called solo status, in which only one candidate does not belong to the majority, stereotypically advantaged group. This is equally important for people of color who are also an underrepresented minority in science and must also push against biases and headwinds. It is likely that the solo status effects also apply to people of color in science, but we do not yet have the data to confirm this. Why is all this important? We at least know that gender stereotypes about women in science are likely to negatively influence the evaluation of women when they represent a small proportion, less than 25%, of the pool of candidates. Solo status means we focus on the candidate as a woman instead of as a scientist. Therefore, we have worked hard to increase the number of women invited for interviews in the last five years. We also always have a strong representation of women on the hiring committee. This is despite the fact that women might have the same or worse biases than men. Rather, we do this to reassure that women have place and power at the MNF. After all, the interview stage is as much about winning the candidate to come to us as it is about selecting them. There are many other hiring measures in place. They are described in the flyer, recruiting for excellence, and will be one of the first things you discuss as a hiring committee. Each of these measures likely made some contribution to the increased hiring of women we have seen in the last years. So what will you do to help ensure a fair and unbiased hiring process? How will your criteria for judging scientific excellence change, given the empirical evidence of biased treatment of women in science? And how will you acknowledge and combat your own biases as we go forward in our recruitment and hiring of excellent colleagues?